From the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., call on Congress. The program discussing national issues that affect Oklahoma. Your host, U.S. Representative Tom Cole. Thank you for joining me today for another edition of Coal on Congress. Today we're privileged to have with us as our special guest from the neighboring state of Texas, Congressman Michael Burgess. Serving his third term in the House of Representatives, Michael currently sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee and serves as Vice Chairman of the House Republican Policy Committee. Congressman Burgess is a licensed medical doctor with a special interest in health issues. He's here today to provide us with a most up-to-date perspective on a few different health-related issues and to give us some insight uh, as a medical professional. Uh, Congressman, good to have you on with us today. Tom, but, thank you for having me. Well, I'm going to ask you. Privilege is mine. Actually. Oh, actually not. But I'm going to I'm going to start by by asking you uh, why in the world did you, as a doctor, decide you wanted to run for Congress? Um, this is just a half hour show, so we don't have time. <laughs> Let me concentrate on the things <laughs> that prepare you for Congress that you learn and do as a uh, student of medicine and and as a practicing physician. I mean, obviously, we're good listeners, and clearly, uh, we're action oriented. And frankly, what's really served me the best is we're lifelong learners. Um, the uh, the fact is that uh, every night that I'm up here, I'm spending time with four subcommittees on energy and commerce. There's not a lot of downtime, so I get to spend every night with a, a binder aptly prepared by my staff to bring me up to date on whatever issue we're going to be tackling the next day. But you know, I just got to tell you, it's it's been a great transition for me. You figure right now we're probably perched. Uh, on a transformational time in medicine. And think of the last century, three different times during the last century. The introduction of the Flexner Report in 1910, uh, the introduction of penicillin and cortisone on large-scale production in the mid-1940s when Franklin Roosevelt said employers can provide health insurance. Think of the impact of the intersection between the science of medicine and health care policy on Washington, D.C. And then in 1965, Lyndon Johnson with the Medicare program at the same time, we were producing newer and better antibiotics, the antipsychotics for the first time, antidepressants became widely available. This was a, a transformational time back in the 60s, and I believe we're sitting on this just a tr such a transformational time right now. No question the presidential election next year adds another element of drama to it. And my focus right now, my, my goal, my, my mission, if you will, what drives me every day is... I need to be certain that the fundamental unit of production in the, our nation's health care system is that interaction that takes place between the doctor and the patient in the treatment room. Maybe the operating room, maybe the emergency room, but that fundamental interaction that takes place between the doctor and the patient. And are we doing things that bring value to that interaction, or are we doing things that take value from that interaction? So almost any piece of health legislation that comes across our desk, I try to look at through that prism, because after all, the transformational part of medicine is improving. You know, think of it, the American medical machine produces a widget, and that's the widget we produce, and we've got to do the best darn job at producing that widget that, that anyone can. If we become bound by the transactions, if we become transactional instead of transformational, we're actually going to go in the wrong direction. And being such a pivotal time in medicine, such a pivotal time in our nation's health care policy, we just can't afford to get it wrong. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, I think the average uh, person would say, gosh, America's got the greatest health care system in the world. There's more options. There's more quality there's, uh, than certainly any place else in the world and at any other point in our history. And yet... Uh, you know, there's obviously huge concerns about the cost. Well, what can we do in terms of what, what are the factors driving the cost and, and to what degree, if any, can we control them? And then second, uh, great concern about the sheer number of people that don't have health insurance and uh, they, in the end, get health care, but does it come too late? Uh, they avoid preventative uh, type health care. And what are the sorts of things we can do to make it easier for people to get quality health care on a regular basis? It has to be one of our main the, the main things on which we focus. The affordability of health care is is the weak link in our medical system. You've correctly alluded to the fact that the science of medicine in this country, uh, what we do on the scientific level, 
is is unparalleled in this country. When I was a medical student back at the uh, Texas Medical Center down in Houston, people would fly in from all over the world to avail themselves of the type of medicine that was practiced at the Texas Medical Center. And it wasn't all just Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey, though they were <laughs> a big part of it, obviously. The, uh, the aspect of affordability is something that we can't lose sight of. We've done some things that I think have, have really put a, a great improvement out there. The changes with health savings accounts that we did in 2003 was, it was a transformational change. Unfortunately, it doesn't get the advertisement and it doesn't get the people interested that it should get interested. Why don't you should explain interested. quickly, because a lot of our listeners won't know what a health savings account is for that very reason. Well, let me just give you an example from my own life. Mid-1990s, I had an adult child who uh, decided to move back home, not work. I don't recommend that to anyone <laughs> of your listeners who's thinking about it, but I had a real problem with finding health insurance for my child and I knew I needed it because if something dreadful were to happen I wanted to be sure, certain that the care was there and I struggled for probably a year and a half to two years to try to find insurance and finally did well fast forward to today you go on the internet type in health savings account and go to a, a site like eHealth insurance and you can see suddenly in front of you if you're a young man just getting out of college age 25 non-smoker in the state of Texas uh, where I've done most of my research you can buy a, a policy which is a high deductible policy for around fifty five to seventy dollars a month clearly much less than the fourteen thousand dollars a year that were always quoted up here now it does have a high deductible so that individual if they want to uh, get a flu shot they're probably paying out of pocket for that but if they have a motorcycle accident and spend two or three days in the intensive care unit at ten or twenty thousand dollars a day, they're going to be covered for that. That's a, that's a great idea. That's a great uh, uh, concept. Uh, do you have any concerns? I do that it's going to be we're going to be able to keep it because there's a lot of uh, attacks on the concept of health care savings accounts right here in Washington now. I yeah, and I don't. I frankly don't understand that. Look, we need. We need everything. We need all hands on deck. Do we still need employer-derived health insurance? You bet we do. A lot of employers provide a good product for their employees. They have the ability, if they have a large number of employees, they have the ability to drive health behavior in the right direction. And let me give you an example of that in just a minute. But also, we need the, we need the public aspect. Right now, we in Congress are responsible for about 50 cents out of every health care dollar that's spent. So we need to be certain that we're doing that correctly. We're reaching the people that we need to reach, that we're supposed to reach. That was the argument that we had on state children's health insurance last week. Uh, we were reaching out into income brackets we had no business going into. We need to focus on the poor children, where the children between 150 and 200 percent of federal poverty limit that were, the program was originally intended for. Uh, let me just say one thing about the, the employer-derived health insurance. I, I have a child who uh, works for uh, one of the school districts in my district, and he has health insurance through his employer. I asked him the other day, have you been keeping up with like uh, routine checks? He said, no, they came in the other day and uh, did some blood work for us, and I, I tested okay. I said, well, isn't that interesting? How much did that cost you? He said, oh, it didn't cost me a dime. In fact, they're giving me $20 a month off of my health insurance premium for participating in the program. What a phenomenally good idea for a large employer like one of the largest independent school districts in my, in my, in my counties to step forward and say, look, we're going to save you $240 a year if you will let us make certain for you that you don't have a problem with elevated cholesterol that's silent right now, that you don't have a problem with diabetes that hasn't been recognized because we think that by treating you earlier, we're going to save money and give you the option, in fact, of increasing the number of years you spend in good health rather than increasing the number of years you spend in bad health. That's the type of change we need to be talking about, not how do we fix things around the margins and, uh, and, and bring a few more income groups into the state children's health insurance program. No, how do we deliver value to the doctor and the patient so that they can do a better job of maintaining health? We're going to have a lot of discussion in the next couple of years, already are having it over what's called single-payer single, single payer health care, which really means government health care, that, you know, <coughs> that everybody should, should have a government-sponsored policy and uh, uh, that way everybody's covered. Uh, give me your perspective as a medical professional and as a congressman on that as an idea. Well, obviously, one of my one of my charges is to prevent prevent that from happening. Um, 
if it does become inevitable, then one of my charges will be, again, to focus on the doctor-patient interaction. How do we preserve value in what now will become a very hostile environment for preserving value at the level of the doctor-patient interaction? We'll have all of our decisions, again, will become transactional instead of transformational. I think, I think that's the wrong direction to go. But if it happens, we, we, you and I, those of us who, <laughs> who are in Congress and who are responsible for the implementation of those programs, must be ever vigilant so that we keep the focus on the patient. We keep some of the power in the hands of the patient, and we don't give it all up to the reach and grab of the federal government. Now, to be sure, there are some, some people, some segments of the population that will be benefited by that in the short term. In the long term, what are we going to do to medical innovation in this country? I mean, you referenced it before. We have, we have some of the soundest science in medicine in the world in this country. Of the last uh, 20 Nobel Prizes awarded, uh, the vast number have gone to American scientists or to foreign scientists who have trained and are working in the United States. F four of the last five major scientific discoveries in medicine are here in the United States. Why is that? Well, it's because we live in freedom. We are, we are, we are couched in that. Our, our psyches believe that we have the freedom of thought and the freedom of expression, and our system will tolerate a little bit of chaos. That is, if things go off in one direction and don't turn out to be correct, we can regroup and go off in another direction. You hear about that all the time. Uh, one of the big drug companies was recently working on a new uh, compound, I think, as a cholesterol-lowering medication. It turned out to not be as good as they thought. Uh, they've now regrouped and gone in another direction. If you have the government in control of all of that, it becomes then a political issue. And, and you and I decide, not the scientists who are working at NIH and in the private labs around the world, you and I decide what, uh, what diseases are going to be studied, what medicines are going to be developed. And uh, I just got to tell you, I don't think that's the best way to go. Well, you mentioned uh, drug coverage. We, you know, one of the periodic controversies that we have here in Washington is the importation of uh, foreign uh, manufactured pharmaceuticals and whether that's good or bad and particularly the uh, the conduit of going up to Canada and buying online give me your perspective on that as a uh, as both a, is it cost effective is it safe well buying online I, I, I would just put a big couple of underlines is is not safe because you don't know who you're buying from and while they may have a nice maple leaf on their website it doesn't mean that it's coming from Canada it can be coming from anywhere in the world and that anywhere would include some some manufacturing uh, locations and some manufacturing processes that, that none of us would would want to participate in let alone ingest in our bodies or, or give to a family member to ingest we've got enough problems right now with the uh, imports we have with Tommy with the, the train <laughs> I don't need my toys and pet food yeah exactly I don't I mean, my Lipitor con contaminated with melamine. These are the kinds of problems that, uh, and, and for the pharmaceutical uh, grouping, it is, it is obviously very critical. Um, we have spent a lot of time in my committee investigating and focusing on those three issues, the in investigation of imported uh, toys and, and consumer goods and the Consumer uh, Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection Subcommittee, and then on the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, we're focusing on the importation of pharmaceuticals as well as the, the importation of foods that are under the jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration. It's an interesting, it's a fascinating concept. I had no idea the how vast the imported portions of our consumable goods, and I'll include food and drugs into those groups, uh, that are imported from other countries. And there are some real problems out there. Well, you've, uh, you've been a leader also in the area of medical liability reform. And, uh, you know, that's one that we, again, hear a lot about. We've passed several versions of it in the House. Uh, it never got through the Senate. Now it, uh, nothing seems to be moving anywhere. How important is that as a factor in rising costs, and what would be an appropriate uh, kind of remedy that would, uh, again, leave the patient some protection against obvious negligence, but at the same time uh, keep the cost at some reasonable level so it's not, uh, not such a driver in the overall cost of medical care? Well, I could give you the theory, but actually the application in this instance is, uh, is a better example. Um, just your neighbor to the south, my state of Texas, <laughs> enacted very far-reaching medical liability reform in, in 2003. Just a little over four years ago, we passed a constitutional amendment to allow that bill to become law. And the landscape in Texas, as far as medical liability, has altered dramatically in that four years' time. We had gone from a situation where we had probably 17 liability insurers who were insuring doctors in the state 
uh, down to two right about the time that that I ran for office, took office, and, and left my practice. Since the passage of that bill in September, passage of the Constitutional Amendment of September of 2003, we are now uh, well up on the number of insurers back in the state. You, know, you don't get a lot of competition when you just got two guys selling your liability <laughs> insurance. And as a consequence, as you might imagine, the premiums were going up year over year. My quote for my premium, had I practiced in 2003, was substantially increased from what it had been the year before, and that was substantially increased from what it had been the year before that. So what's happened in Texas? What's happened to doctors and premiums since we passed that legislation? Uh, premiums have come down significantly, and most importantly, they aren't going up. The double-digit uh, the, the uh, occurrences that were happening year over year in the early part of, of this century. The other a aspect of, the, of what happened in Texas that I like, even... I'll even go out on a limb and say I liked a little bit more than what we did up here uh, the past four years, even though I voted for those bills as they came through. It uh, it took its uh, its inspiration after the Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act of 1975 out in California. Many people who are familiar with this topic will know that that placed a cap on non-economic damages of $250,000 in, in a medical liability lawsuit. The concept was that there's only there's a finite number of dollars you can spread around in the healthcare system. If you have these large dollar awards, someone else somewhere along the line is going to be uh, is going to be paying that price in some way, shape, or form. Either the cost of higher costs for hospitalizations, or their doctor can't get insurance and leaves town, someone else will be bearing that cost. In Texas, to uh, sort of acknowledge that uh, the world's a little bit different place 25 years later, we do have a cap on non-economic damages. There's a cap for the physician, a cap for the hospital, and a cap for a nursing home or a second hospital if one is involved. So that gives us an aggregate cap of $750,000. Of course, actual damages, there's no limit. They can still be recovered. And in fact, in Texas, we left punitive damages on the table as well. So. Uh, if someone is injured through fault of a hospital or physician, there is still a substantial amount of money that they can collect. But what we did do away with are the 20 and 30 million dollar verdicts that you would hear about that, again, take forever to work their way through the courts. The patient sees help maybe eight, 10, or 12 years later. I mean, that's the problem that we were up against in Texas, and plus the fact that you could not find a doctor to come to South Texas and practice because the climate was so harsh. Now, uh, <clears throat> we can't keep up with the number of applications for Texas medical licenses. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, doctors are coming into areas that were previously underserved. And um, I don't know if we've had a flood of lawyers leaving the state, but let me know <laughs> if they all start showing up in Oklahoma. I'll put that into the talk. Now, we have our own indigenous supply. I think we're in good shape. Uh, we don't need any new imports. Uh. <laughs> But let me, I'm going to switch very dramatically because I originally intended this whole show to be on health care. But you, like uh, me, recently uh, uh, were in Iraq and have seen some of the phenomenal changes underway there. So I'd like you, if you would, to uh, tell our viewers a little bit about when you were there, what you've seen, your assessment on ground, and let's have a little dialogue about that. Well, that would be good because I understand you recently, so your, your information is even more recent than mine. Um, in July, I took my sixth trip to Iraq. The July before, July of 2006, I had made a trip at that point, and there were some things that were looking positive in July of 2006, but one of them wasn't the western part of Iraq, Al Anbar province. In fact, General Chiarelli, who briefed us uh, one day when we were there, said, listen, I don't know what this means, and it's too soon to make anything out of it, but we just had a hospital in Ramadi handed over to the Marines. And this was the place where the insurgents, the Al-Qaeda groups, had sort of based themselves, was out of the hospital in Ramadi. Well, then we got... That's uh, in July of this year. July right? of 06. 06, okay. Then we get into, and I, you know, I guess because it was election year, or I don't know what the reason was, we heard nothing but bad news for months and months and months. So the president said, we'll send more troops in. Very controversial decision. Is that, in fact, the right thing to do? Um, but I had this little nagging thought in the back of my mind about what, what, what was it about that hospital where, where the guys, where the, the townspeople turned it back over to the Marines in July of 2006. 
So I knew we were going to get the report from General Petraeus. I knew that consistently the news that was coming out of Iraq was bad, but I also knew that every time I'd been there before, what I saw on the ground looked different from what I saw on television. So I knew I had to go back, and I wanted to go back before Petraeus came and General Petraeus came and, and talked with us, along with Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Uh, and it worked out that I got to go about the third weekend in July. It's two days, so an overnight, I'm just there and back, didn't miss a vote. Uh, it is possible to do that, but it's a lot of wear and tear on your, uh, on your biological clock. What I saw when we were there, uh, I, I, was, I was not prepared for. I was actually prepared for so much bad news that, that maybe, maybe we do have to rethink this thing. But what I saw on the ground, first off, the morale of our troops was excellent. Uh, they could see the, the change that was happening on the ground. They were uh, very much wanting to be able to complete the job they had started. The 15-month rotations were, were tough as can be on them and their families, no, no question about it. But they actually saw some light at the end of the tunnel on this because of what's now referred to as the Anbar Awakening. And Unlike 2006, where they said there's no way you could go into Al Anbar province, as soon as we landed in Baghdad and got off the C-130, they said, "Well, let's get on the Black Hawk. We're going to fly down to Al Anbar." Whoa, are you sure? <laughs> Last year you told me you wouldn't take the member of Congress down to Al Anbar. I said, "But only we're going to take you to Anbar. We're going to walk around." And indeed, we went down and had the obligatory death by PowerPoint uh, briefing <laughs> from the generals on the ground, and then we loaded up and drove downtown. Uh, walked through the market, and it was a busy Saturday morning, just like a market anywhere else in the Middle East. I saw more women on this trip than I have seen in a long time in Iraq. So I'm going to take that as a good sign. Children were walking around. Apparently, they've had uh, good exposure to our Marines and GIs because they asked for quarters and pens. Uh, <laughs> apparently, these are items that will be dispensed with to, uh, to children who, who ask. They have school starting. They had, at that time, school was starting in a, in a few weeks, so obviously the pens were something they had need of. But it was, uh, it was phenomenal to be able to walk around. I was in, of course, a bulletproof vest and a hard hat, just like they instructed us to do. And I felt a little guilty walking around looking like that with everyone else walking around in, in basically jeans and T-shirts and uh, the kind of clothes that you would associate with a comfortable Saturday morning in the marketplace. And uh, I understand you uh, you tried to get rid of some of your gear. I did. I did lift the helmet <laughs> off at one point, but I was corrected in that action, and it was suggested that I that I replace it. But I understand a uh, different different situation that you encountered when you. You went. know, very much so. I'm I'm like you. I had uh, my last trip actually had been about the same time as yours. Uh, this was my seventh. I'd gone in uh, July and August of 2006, and. Uh, uh, it's that very same experience. Uh, you know, I'd always wanted to go out to Anbar Province. I'd always been told since 2003, you know, you can't go there. It's too dangerous. That's the center of the Sunni insurgency. So we uh, we took a uh, trip. Came in first, spent a day in Kuwait to look at the logistical operation that supports troops and, frankly, where American troops will begin to egress, uh, yes. begin to exit from the country, and how quickly could that be handled when the decisions are made. Uh, then we were uh, in uh, looking at uh, you know, medical uh, care at both uh, Balad and at Langstall on the way out and uh, see how that's going. And, of course, as you know better than me, that's just absolutely fabulous first rate. So it's the best uh, that you could have. Uh, but the, the real crux of the mission was to see what's happening on ground. Has the surge worked? Are things getting better? So we spent uh, uh, time uh, uh, in both uh, Baghdad, first time outside the green zone for me since 2003, uh, we were out in a Sunni neighborhood uh, in one of these new joint security stations operated by American uh, soldiers, Iraqi soldiers, and Iraqi police. It was a Sunni neighborhood that was surrounded on three sides by uh, uh, Sadr City, a Shia stronghold, and where there had been considerable tension. There had been uh, the, the colonel who did the brief, uh, who's from Lawton, Oklahoma, told me that. Uh, uh, when they got there six months ago, they were averaging about 250 to 300 uh, murders a month in the area, uh, the execution-style murders. That was down to fewer than 20. You know, it's still too many, but a, an extraordinary drop. And uh, while we were there, we saw 200 or so Sunni young men signing up to be members of the local police force with the local sheikh there sort of encouraging them and bringing them in. Uh, so that there would be an element of community, what, what our police would call community policing going on, local people looking after their area where they knew everything. But the eye-opener was the same one you'd had. That was, we then, uh, we spent the night there and then we were out in Ramadi the next day. 
and that was extraordinary. Um, we got, uh, as you point out, our, our typical PowerPoint briefing. Uh, but uh, frankly, the Marine uh, General, General uh, John Allen and Army Colonel that was there, uh, General, or excuse me, Colonel uh, John Charlton were very anxious to get us out of the city. They wanted us to see. This is, by the way, very different than when I'd been in Fallujah two years before, where we kind of stayed in base. They didn't want you to go out and look. They said, look, you've got to come see what's going on. And boy, uh, we went to a, uh, uh, there was a, a, a opening of a new business incubation center. There was hundreds and hundreds of people and local leaders, a lot of people carrying guns. All the local sheikhs had their own security guys with them. Uh, as uh, Charlton said, he said, your big danger here is if one security force fights another one. But the mood was friendly. People were very happy to have us there. And uh, again, we were and we were traveling with no body armor and no helmets, uh, and then from there into the marketplaces, same kind of response. Children coming up, uh, uh, it was a, an incredible transformation. And uh, we traveled through the central part of the city with a Marine Colonel as our military escort from here, who had been in Ramadi in 2004. And he said, "I want you to know, you couldn't have gone 10 yards here in 2004 or five without either an IED attack or." Uh, drawing small arms fire, and here you are out here with no body armor. So uh, there is something quite remarkable going on from the bottom up. People, we talked to one colonel at another joint security station, an Iraqi colonel, who I found out later had actually been part of the insurgency two or three years before. Uh, but he was, number one, extraordinarily grateful to the Marines and the soldiers. He said, you know, we saw what al-Qaeda was like. We lived with them. They were here controlling our neighborhoods. And you're sitting in what six months ago was probably the most dangerous spot in Iraq. And we're here feeding you lunch, and you're surrounded by people in the market, which we were. And, and he said, uh, uh, you know, they're not, uh, Al-Qaeda are not real Muslims. Real Muslims see uh, Jahid as, a, as a, a, an effort to sacrifice for their community and, and uh, sacrifice themselves for their faith. They use it as a, as a w way to murder people and intimidate people. And I mean, he went on and on and on uh, about uh, they, they intended to fight al-Qaeda and fight the, the terrorists uh, uh, forever. So, I mean, it was, it was extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. That, uh, very similar to your type of experience. Well, a local political shift is really what has been impressive. And seeing the mayor of Ramadi, a city about the size of Fort Worth, and uh, he said, uh, I need more federal money, and by the way, next year this place is really going to be something. Come back and bring your family. Oh, sound like a mayor in any one of the cities not, that I represent. You, as a Texan, you might, might not appreciate this, but uh, I must tell you, we went down to a government service center, and it was being operated by a bunch of kids from Tulsa, Oklahoma, with local people, and they were figuring out how to get sewage and how to get the electricity. But posted on the wall were all the OU and OSU football scores. So we already had one up there with Texas losing. But... Uh, you know, not. Uh, I, I don't get your point. <laughs> well, we've gone on a long time, Congressman. We're just about out of time, but I wanted to thank you for for coming out today to join the show, and I appreciate obviously your service, Mike, in the in the Congress. And uh, as we continue to debate these issues, health care to Iraq, uh, obviously, I know both of us will be working hard to do the right thing for the American people. But you were getting ready to make a quick point. Well, I forgot to mention my medical liability bill, which is thirty five oh nine. Well, give welcome, me, give, welcome, welcome, people. Give to your website aboard. a quick plug because you have more information on health care on your website than anybody in Congress. www.house.gov/slash Burgess. Now, if you want to know the latest on health care, that's the place to go. Mike, thanks so much thank for you, being Tom. here. Really do appreciate it and appreciate your service. Oh, thank you.